the speed paint. The biggest topic in this community is how to get your miniatures painted quick and fast. In our busy life, we don't usually have enough time to actually go around and paint plastic toy soldiers, much less do anything else. So, speed painting is a method of getting your miniatures done quick and easily. When we think about speed painting, we're essentially figuring out how we can get a product done as fast as we can without having to sacrifice model quality. Doing an effective speed paint has to do two major factors. Firstly, it has to go over every detail on the model. If you don't do this, it will look sloppy, it looks like you're sacrificing your quality for time, which you might have to do if you're really trying to bust out something for a convention or a new tournament or whatever. But if you don't have a major time limit, then it's best to increase the time and don't discount the quality. Secondly, it has to be done in a single session, perhaps two, but preferably one. You had to go from prime to finished model. If you don't, then it's very tempting to take your project, which is supposed to be done quickly, get bored on it, and then push it off to the side and start working on something that's shiny and new. We're trying to finish a project here. So it's in our best interest to get this thing done in a manner that will facilitate being done quickly. Hence, only one or two sessions of painting. This does mean that we have to sacrifice some quality on the details in order to get the project done. But it also means we don't have to do them, so we're free not to ignore them, which is pretty nice, because I don't like having to do a whole lot of rendering work on something that's really not going to be seen by 80% of the people who are actually going to see the model. Here you can see all my models gray and based, ready for priming. The first significant step is to address the model's gaps in the cloaks. I use Liquitex modeling paste for this. Traditionally, this is used to give acrylic paint more volume and body for impasso painting, which is painting with texture, but I found it very effective for gap filling and texture on models. I tried putting some on the model's cloaks here to give more visual distinction between the cloth and the flat metal surfaces, but ultimately this didn't quite pan out the way I'd hoped. The gap filling is quite effective, however, for such a quick pass. Next is priming these models black. I use Molotow one for all black for this as it easily passes through the airbrush and results in a nice satin finish after it is dry, in only about 10 or so minutes. I then move directly into my metal colors. I use Deathless Metal mixed with a little bit of turquoise ink and spray all these models' metal components. As my models utilize copper as their main metal color, they need as much contrast as possible. So I boost the contrast here of a bluish tone on the first pass and quickly cut in the main color. This is pretty dark on the camera, almost black, but the effect is in fact more striking than a pure black, which would contain no visual information. The next step is a harsh jump in value with pure copper. Monument copper is very shiny and brilliant, which makes it very good for getting attention on metals. Metal paints tend to separate in the airbrush, so I add a little bit of glaze medium with my thinner to help the dispersion. I spray from above, trying to get a little on the lower elements, but not fearing letting some be hidden from view. The models are now very shiny and brilliant, which is good, as I will weather them down later. If weathering is on the mind for a project, it helps to push things a bit further in the preparatory stages, as the effect will be toned down when you add in all the visual information that the weathering gives. Using US camo green and some sap green, I cut in the cloaks with my airbrush. While I used to be afraid of overspray, I found that the visual impact of it to be quite negligible for a speed paint, and in fact, it can be a benefit to the look of the model, letting the natural effect of lighting come from the work of the airbrush. Next is my camo effect. I purchased this airbrush texture decal some time ago and found all sorts of interesting effects for it, mainly for setting quick camo effects on models. Brown, khaki, and black get put on in order to get the visual depth that real camo has. Painting in this way, you have to be a bit mindful of your overspray, but a small amount is not a huge problem, and the weathering stage will fix major issues later. 
I lay them decal as flat as possible against the model, and spray mostly air to get the fine relief of the decal on the model's surface. Surprisingly, the visual look doesn't need to be entirely over the surface of the model to register as a camo effect, just over the largest sections. Titan buff is next, my off-white color. In hindsight, this color was a bit too white for my liking here, and I should have used a real khaki instead, but overall this effect is still effective. Finally, I use straight black ink, and this stage really sets the camo effect and gives it visual depth. From here, you could layer on additional camo effects, but here, it's plenty enough for a speed paint. Time for some brushwork. I set up my palette with tones for my guns, wires, and tubes, and backpacks. For the various cables and other wires on the model, I use carbon black, as the color is very glossy and will be visually interesting even though there's not any additional work done on them. The reflections will give the tubing volume through their finish, rather than me having to go in and paint each individual nub. I also cover the model's eye lenses with Black Templar and some of this tone for additional opacity. The browns here are for the gun stocks and the backpacks. A good trick for painting squads of individual models is to use similar colors for similar details, about the use of the exact same tone. This makes each model have a little bit more depth and more individuality, even if they all belong as a single unit. Next are purity seals. I use some unbleached titanium, quinacridone red, and the camo green from before. As my scheme uses a lot of green within its gamut, pure red will stand out a little bit too much and be visually distracting. So I mix in a little bit of the green to desaturate the color down and make it more harmonious with the model. Here you can see the look of the mixed red with a pure variety. The paper is just a flat layer of unbleached titanium. A good, warm, off-white that I have found more and more uses for as of late. They will be washed with some brown and then left alone later. The bases are quickly set with a charred brown, and I move on to the eyes of my model as they dry. Here I use some heavy body white for the eyes, as the volume of this paint will give a physical dot of color, more striking than that of a soft body of acrylic. I could paint in the glowing effect. When your models have these cute baby eyes, why not add some tiny little cartoon dots for them to maximum character and cuteness? Even from a distance, these eyes have a fair amount of character to them. Next up is weathering. I use oil paint for my verdigris effect, with phthalo green, sorellum blue, and titanium and zinc white. I add some white spirit to my dish and mix in my colors, and slowly add in my white. Titanium white is bold and opaque, whereas zinc white is a bit transparent, so I modify and mix slowly and wait to use titanium white until I'm more confident in how everything is looking. The effect adds an instant amount of depth to the copper effect, and I carefully wash each model individually. You can wait, or use a heat gun or dryer, to move the process along and evaporate the white spirit. Afterward, the oil will remain active for a few hours, so there's no need to rush. Here the model is dried somewhat, and you can see the effect is quite interesting, but you can go further. For me, I go in with some undiluted paint and pick out some areas I think need more weathering. Afterward, I use some foam from an old kit and wipe away excess paint and give the model some streaks from the still active oil present on the model. You can pull the sponge, dab it for texture, and do all sorts of things with the effect. Experiment! I quickly dry brush my bases of unbleached titanium, and quickly follow with some glowing OSL for the parts of the model. This for less than high flow color from Golden I found to be very good for setting quick lighting effects as the color is very opaque for a fluorescent color.
You can stop with just the fluorescent base, but I feel the need for greater contrast. So I add in some white and yellow ink to my mix and boost the values of my glows at their sources. Finalizing the effect of a pure white oil wash in the areas I want to glow most. This effect is good, but it usually needs two coats to work as the oil likes to settle due to gravity. Next, I add some natural weather into the models with the addition of moss and growth on top of them. I use some green flock and some super glue and simply glue fuzzy little balls to the model. This is an effective way to cover mistakes you made over the painting process. The last couple of steps are finishing touches. I start by setting the edges of my bases black. This step helps solidify the model's base and gives it a visual barrier to compare to, as the solid black frames everything against a neutral background, as well as looking sleek and sophisticated. Finally, I edge highlight some parts with vivid lime green and some unbleached titanium giving them more visual direction. And this is the final result. Four and a half hours of work for 10 models is a good benchmark for speed painting. And you can see you could easily shorten this up or extend it to whatever kind of painting once you could desire. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing so I can create more content for you. And if you really liked my work, see my portfolio, where you can see more and perhaps ask for a commission. Take care, and have a good one.